हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू क्रिएटिव मेडिसिन इन दिस लेक्चर वी विल लर्न अबाउट हेलो फ्रेंड्स लेट अस नाउ लर्न अबाउट थायराइड नॉर्मल वेट ऑफ द थायराइड इज 20 टू 25 ग्राम्स The storage site of iodine is thyroid gland. Almost ninety percent of iodine in our body is stored in the thyroid gland. Normal daily requirement of iodine is around hundred to one fifty microgram per day. And if you see weight of the thyroid gland is inversely proportional to the iodine intake. Then, if you were asked who is the father of the thyroid surgery. Father of thyroid surgery is Theodor Kocher. Is the father of thyroid surgery. Where is isthmus related to? Isthmus related to second, third, and fourth tracheal rings. Isthmus is related to. We have some effects which are important. One we have Wolff-Jakob effect. What is Wolff-Jakob effect? Iodine-induced hypothyroidism is Wolff-Jakob effect. Then we have George Bezdos effect. George Bezdos effect is iodine induced hyperthyroidism is George Bezdos effect. Then we have Pendred syndrome. In Pendred syndrome, there will be congenital sensory neural hearing loss is seen. In Pendred syndrome, the gene is located on chromosome seven Q. Then we have one more syndrome which is called as Rofetov syndrome. In Rofetov syndrome, there is end organ. a resistance is seen to t4 so these are important points so let me repeat this again so first normal weight of thyroid is 20 to 25 grams storage site of thyroid so sorry storage site of iodine is thyroid gland normal daily requirement of iodine is uh, 100 to 150 microgram per day weight of the thi thyroid gland is inversely proportional to iodine intake Who is the father of thyroid gland surgery? Theodor Kocher. Isthmus is related to second, third, and fourth tracheal rings. Then Wolff-Jakob effect is iodine-induced hypothyroidism, whereas George Bezdos effect is iodine-induced hyperthyroidism. Pendred syndrome is congenital sensory neural hearing loss along with goiter is Pendred syndrome. With gene location is chromosome number seven Q that is long arm. Then Rofetov syndrome. Rofetov syndrome is end organ resistance to T4 is seen. Then let us now learn some important points about thyroglossal cyst. In thyroglossal cyst, thyroglossal cyst is actually a congenital disorder where the age of presentation is twelve to fifteen to thirty years, and there is cyst is seen in connection with the thyroid and the tongue. you will see presence of cyst being connected to the thyroid and the tongue now because the cyst is connected to the thyroid and the tongue on protrusion of the tongue the cyst will move upwards most common location is subhyoid location the other locations include suprahyoid location near the thyroid cartilage and these also include near the foramen cecum and also in the floor of the mouth so if you see the clinical features clinical features are you will see a midline swelling which is seen in the anterior part of the neck and this will move on deglutition move actually it will move down on deglutition and move up on protrusion of the tongue so if you see the complications infection leads to abscess formation so this abscess can be incision and drainage is done if incision in drainage is done this leads to formation of thyroglossal fistula so this thyroglossal fistula is actually an acquired lesion so this thyroglossal cyst increases the risk of papillary carcinoma of thyroid so the treatment of choice is cyst trunk operation is the treatment of choice where you the cyst when you remove the in cyst trunk operation you will remove the central part of hyoid bone is removed along with the cyst is removed in cyst trunk operation so this is about the thyroglossal cyst let's let me repeat it again thyroglossal cyst is a congenital condition 
where the age of presentation is 15 to 30 years. Here there is a cyst which is located in connection to thyroid and the tongue. So on protrusion of the tongue, the cyst will move upwards. The most common location being subhyoid. Other locations like suprahyoid near the thyroid cartilage, near the foramen cecum and in the floor of the mouth. So if you see the clinical features, there is a midline swelling in the anterior part of the neck which moves with deblutition up and it also moves up on protrusion of the tongue so if you see the complications first there will be infection which leads to abscess formation and then if you do incision and drainage then there will be formation of thyroglossal fistula which is an expired condition this thyroglossal cyst also increases the the risk of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. Treatment is you should do cyst trunk operation is done where you remove the hyoid bone, central part of hyoid bone along with the cyst. Then let us now learn some important points about goiter. So goiter, goiter is endemic goiter. So we have first we will see goiter. If goiter is said to be endemic goiter, if there are more than 5% of people in the population have goiter, then we call it as endemic goiter. Then we have retrosternal goiter or we have substernal goiter or mediastinal goiter. In this, if more than 50% of the thyroid tissue is located be below the thoracic cage, then we call it as retrosternal goiter or a sternal goiter or mediastinal goiter. Here most of the patients are asymptomatic and they are mainly diagnosed incidentally by the radiological investigations. Then if you see the signs and symptoms, the signs include the most common symptom being dyspnea and the most dyspnea occurs mainly due to the compression of the trachea and there will be dysphagia mainly due to the compression of esophagus and the patient also develops hoarseness of the voice will occur due to recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and there will be dilated veins as seen over the anterior chest wall and then there is a sign called as Pemberton sign where bilateral upper limb elevation when you do when the patient does bilateral upper limb elevation this will result in uh, facial puffiness will be seen in the upper limb the patient will have facial puffiness and facial congestion is seen on bilateral upper limb elevation then the treatment is you should remove the thyroid you can do thyroidectomy is done by cervical incision and the radioisotopes used are T half of iodine 123 which is used is 13 hours and T half of iodine 131 which can be used is 8 days. But here in radioactive iodine T123 that is 13 hours it is used mainly for diagnostic purposes whereas T131 which is used for 8 days it is used for therapeutic purposes. So uh, this 123 is used for iodine ablation. Whereas 131 is used for therap sorry 123 is used for radioactive iodine scan that is diagnostic purpose whereas 131 is used for radioactive iodine ablation. Next, next we will learn some important points about radioactive iodine ablation. So radioactive iodine ablation if you see in this iodine 131 will emit beta rays and also it emits gamma rays also. Beta rays are responsible for the therapeutic effect. The beta rays will penetrate 0.5 millimeters of the tissue and it will ablate only the, para, only the thyroid whereas parathyroid is also safe whereas gamma rays are responsible for the side effects. So gamma rays are used only in tracer studies. So in gamma rays you will use a gamma probe can be used for identifying the area that emits the gamma rays and so this is useful in radioactive iodine scan. If you see the absolute contraindications of radioactive iodine scan is pregnancy and lactation is the contraindication of radioactive iodine scan. Then let us now learn some important point about radioactive iodine uptake. The amount of radioactive iodine taken up by the thyroid scan within a stipulated amount of time is called as radioactive iodine uptake. So radioactive iodine scan is also called as thyroid scan. Here there is here we will scan the cervical region mainly for the gamma uptake. Mainly for the sorry sorry we will scan the thyroid 
gland with a gamma probe we will we will scan the thyroid scan for ga with gamma probe okay next then if you see the what do you see one you will see hot nodule this hot nodule is increased uptake if increased uptake is seen when compared to the surrounding tissue then we call it has hot nodule if there is decreased uptake is seen when compared to surrounding tissue then we call it cold nodule this has decreased uptake then if there is normal equal then it is fine if it is hot nodule then the risk of malignancy is 1 to 3% if it is cold nodule the risk of malignancy is 17 to 20% then if you see in graves disease in graves disease you will see presence of diffuse uptake of the uh, diffuse uptake it will be seen in graves disease and then we have toxic multinodular goiter in toxic multinodular goiter you will see here there will be increased uptake in certain areas and there will be decreased uptake will be seen in certain areas in toxic multinodular goiter then you see autonomous nodule in autonomous nodule you will see that there will be increased uptake in only one nodule of the thyroid gland that is called has autonomous nodule then we have thyroiditis in thyroiditis actually there will be damage to the thyroid gland so as a result you will see decrease in radioactive iodine uptake will be seen in thyroiditis then next important thing is about thyroidectomy so thyroidectomy is of different types first we have total thyroidectomy where you remove the complete uh, thyroid then it is total thyroidectomy then we have hemithyroidectomy what do you do in hemithyroidectomy in this you will remove the half of the gland will be removed in hemithyroidectomy then we have subtotal thyroidectomy in subtotal thyroidectomy most of the gland is removed but a 3 to 4 grams of the thyroid tissue is left except that the rest of the gland is removed in subtotal thyroidectomy then we have hartley dun dunhill procedure hartley dunhill procedure in hartley dunhill procedure here actually you will remove 4 to 6 grams here you will remove 4 to 6 grams of the thyroid is removed in one lobule so 4 to 6 grams of thyroid will be removed in one lobule will be left in one lobule the rest of the gland is removed only the 4 to 6 grams of thyroid tissue is actually left then we have something called as near total thyroidectomy in near total thyroidectomy you will remove almost all except that a small 1 gram of gland is left that to adjacent to recurrent laryngeal nerve you will leave only 1 gram of gland that is near total thyroidectomy then if you see hemithyroidectomy is mainly done if there is benign lesion that to involving the one lobe then you do hemithyroidectomy total thyroidectomy is preferred if you remove the whole thyroid that is if there is benign lesion or malignant lesion is seen in both the thyroid glands then you do to total thyroidectomy then multinodular goiter is seen then first subtotal thyroidectomy was earlier preferred but now nowadays for multinodular goiter we do total thyroidectomy is done because this total thyroidectomy is easy to manage the patient with lifelong supplementation of levothyroxine then if you do only half hemithyroidectomy then the goiter may recur and it may be difficult for the patient also then but we can also do subtotal thyroidectomy is also done in go in gray in goiter that to multinodular goiter subtotal thyroidectomy is done in elderly patient because we do not expect recurrence in elderly patients due to their short half life short life so as a result subtotal thyroidectomy can be done in elderly patients then then let us now learn some important points about thyroid solitary thyroid nodule so what is solitary thyroid nodule the most common solitary thyroid nodule is actually colloid goiter or uh, follicular adenoma is the most common solitary thyroid nodule then the first investigation which is done for solitary thyroid nodule is we do thyroid function test which is t3 t4 and tsh is done 
TSH gives the most important information regarding the thyroid function parameters. This will also help us to detect the subclinical hypothyroidism can be detected and also subclinical hyperthyroidism can be detected. If there is hypothyroidism, there will be increased TSH. If there is hyperthyroidism, there will be decreased TSH will be seen. Then, if you see the investigation of choice for diagnosis is, you should do FNAC. Then, if you see the limitations, this FNAC cannot differentiate the follicular adenoma from carcinoma. The, it cannot differentiate follicular adenoma and carcinoma. Because the only diagnosis of follicular carcinoma is mainly made by vascular invasion or by capsular invasion, we can mainly diagnose the follicular carcinoma. Then next important thing is Riedel's thyroiditis. Riedel's thyroiditis you will not do. FNAC is not performed because in Riedel's thyroiditis the thyroid tissue is replaced by fibrosis. So as a result even if you do FNAC you will not get anything. So because there is no yield in Riedel's thyroiditis uh, FNAC is not done. Then in thyroid lymphoma. Thyroid lymphoma is it can occur anywhere in the body and here investigation of choice for thyroid lymphoma is biopsy because markers are put over the tissue specimen to confirm the diagnosis of my lymphoma to, to confirm lymphoma you will have to put some markers so for that you need a biopsy specimen most of the cases except these three what are these three except follicular adenoma or renal thyroiditis or except thyroid lymphoma the the rest all we do the rest all the tissue, all the things you can do fnac is the investigation of choice in thyroid diseases then one more important thing is all thyroid diseases are more common in females only then if you see the management management for solitary nodule of thy so solitary thyroid nodule what do you do if there is solitary thyroid thyroid nodule first it can be on fnac it can be inconclusive if it is inconclusive you should do repeat fnac is done then if this is thy th solitary thyroid nodule is benign then you have two chances one it can be cystic lesion second it can be solid lesion if it is cystic lesion you should do aspiration if it is solid lesion, you can give you can give T4 therapy. You can do this aspiration for three times. Even after aspiration of three times, if it recurs, then you can do hemithyroidectomy can be done. Even in solid lesion also, you can do hemithyroidectomy. If you think it is malignant, it can be malignant. That is in suspicious lesions, you should give radioactive iodine scan will be done. If this radioactive iodine scan shows hot, then you can do either radioactive iodine ablation can be done or hemithyroidectomy can be done. If it is cold, then there is a 14 to 20% of malignancy. So it is better to do hemithyroidectomy can be done. If it is malignant, definitely you will do total thyroidectomy is done. Next, next we have Bethesda, Bethesda system. In the Bethesda system, we have Thai 1. Thai 1 is actually non-diagnostic. Then we have Thai 1C which is also non-diagnostic but it is cystic. Then we have Thai 2. This Thai 2 is non-neoplastic. Okay, it is non-neoplastic. Then we have Thai 3. Thai 3 is actually follicular. Then we have Thai 4. Thai 4 is actually suspicious of malignancy. It is suspicious of malignancy. Then we have Thai 6 which is actually malignant. Thai 5. Thai 5 is actually malignant. So what is Bethesda reporting system? Thai 1 non-diagnostic, Thai 1C which is diagno which is uh, non-diagnostic plus cystic, Thai 2 which is non-neoplastic, Thai 3 which is follicular, Thai 4 suspicious of malignancy, Thai 5 is malignant lesion. Then if you see the function of thyroid hormones, thyroid hormones are important for maintaining the basal metabolic rate. They are important for uh, a conversion of mass into energy. They are also important for, so they are also important for um, maintaining the daily activities. So, what are the symptoms of hypothyroidism? If the patient has hypothyroidism, the patient manifests with weight gain, decreased appetite, confusion, 
मिडिलियर इफ्यूजन ब्राडी कार्डिया डायस्टोलिक हाइपर टेंशन कॉन्स्टिपेशन मेनोरेजिया एंड लॉस ऑफ हेयर आर सीन इन हाइपोथाइरोडिज्म इन हाइपर थाइरोडिज्म व्हाट डू यू सी इन हाइपर थाइरोडिज्म देयर विल बी वेट लॉस इंक्रीज्ड एपेटाइट टैकीकार्डिया इंक्रीज्ड स्वेटिंग हेट इन हीट इंटॉलरेंस डायरिया एमेनोरिया रिस्क ऑफ अबॉर्शंस एंड इनफर्टिलिटी आर सीन इन अ पेशेंट विद हाइपर थाइरोडिज्म If you were asked what is the most common cause of hypothyroidism worldwide that is Hashimoto's thyroiditis then if you were asked what is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism worldwide that is Graves disease then then if you see the Graves disease Graves disease is also called as diffuse toxic goiter so this Graves disease or diffuse toxic goiter it is associated mainly with HLA B Uh, 8 and dr3 it is associated with hla b8 and dr3 it is actually an autoimmune disorder here the thyroid stimulating antibody against the tsh receptors it is seen there is thyroid stimulating antibody is present against the tsh receptors now if you see the clinical features there is thyrotoxicosis is present in the patient with increased t3 increased t4 will be seen and also you will see presence of ophthalmopathy you see this ophthalmopathy is actually you will see presence of exophthalmos is seen in the patient with dermopathy is seen which include this dermopathy which is seen in the graves disease is also called as pretibial myxedema where there will be deposition of hexosamine glycosaminoglycans there will be deposition of glycosaminoglycans in the skin and it is also found in hypothyroidism also there is something called as acropaki where there is subperiosteal new bone formation seen in the metacarpals you will see presence of subperiosteal new bone formation is seen this is acropaki then you will also see presence of gynecomastia okay so here in graves disease one more important thing is there is excessive stimulation of auto antibodies occurs on tsh receptor so because of increased stimulation of auto antibodies on tsh receptor this will result in increased t3 and increased t4 so whenever there is increased t3 and t4 this will decrease in tsh will occur so these patients will have increased expression of beta receptors will occur has a result there will be sympathetic stimulation will occur due to the increased expression of beta receptors and if you see the treatment treatment is in this patients you should give non selective beta blockers are given in this patient these non selective beta blockers will block the sympathetic system and also you should give anti thyroid medications are also given to this patient so if you see the clinical features clinical features are you will see signs of sympathetic stimulation like you will see tachycardia palpitations increased sweating is seen tremors are seen especially you will see fine tremors of fingers and tongue will be seen and then there will be signs of thyroid stimulation that is increased t3 and t4 increases the basal metabolic rate and also they increase sweating and heat intolerance will be seen and diarrhea is also seen in a patient with hyperthyroidism and this diarrhea is the most common gi symptom in a patient with hyperthyroidism then if you see in the females there will be amenorrhea will be seen there is increased risk of abortions will be seen there will be infertility and in children there occurs early growth and maturation will occur in the children then if you see in the young patients you will see severe symptoms like atrial fibrillation and congestive heart failure will be seen and now what about the findings the findings are you will see that the patient is hyperactive with increased radioactive iodine uptake scan will be seen there will be diffuse uptake of radioactive iodine will be seen in the whole thyroid gland then then you will also see that uh, there will be palpable thrill may be seen in the patient with audible bruy will be seen and there will be audible venous hum also if you see the investigations presence of eye signs is important and diagnostic of hyperthyroidism then sing single investigation used to confirm it is presence of auto antibodies are used to confirm the diagnosis 
then if you see the management treatment is first you can give propanolol to the treatment which is an anti thyroid drug which will show symptomatic improvement in almost 2 weeks and the patient will become u thyroid within 6 weeks of time the patient becomes u thyroid then if you see anti thyroid drugs which include methimazole carbimazole and propyl thiouracil can be given but this methimazole will result in increased risk of coronal atresia will be seen and there will be increased risk of aplasia cutis and there will be increased risk of aplasia cutis so these are teratogenic manifestations so they are not used in pregnancy these will also cause a granulocytosis also then if you see propyl thiouracil the main side effect of propyl thiouracil is increased hepatic failure is seen in females and children so this is these are important up to the in propyl thiouracil you will see presence of increased hepatic failure in children and females you will see and then and then there is propyl thiouracil is used this propyl thiouracil will block the conversion of t4 to t3 also so if you were asked what is the drug of choice drug of choices especially in graves disease methimazole is the drug of choice in graves disease in pregnancy the drug of choice is propyl thiouracil especially in the first trimester you give propyl thiouracil and carbimazole is given in the second and third trimester then if you were asked what is the drug of choice for thyrotoxic crisis for thyrotoxic crisis it is propyl thiouracil is the drug of choice but the whole treatment of choice is you will do total thyroidectomy is done alternatively you can also do radioactive iodine ablation is done for whom do you do radioactive iodine ablation it is mainly done in elderly patients and those with surgical comorbidities and those with recurrences even after surgery even after surgery if there is recurrences then you do radioactive iodine ablation elderly patients surgical surgery i mean elderly patients with surgery with surgical comorbidities and um, recurrence you do radioactive iodine ablation now what are the contraindications of radioactive iodine ablation so if you see the contraindications we have two types absolute contraindications and relative contraindications relate absolute contraindications are pregnancy and lactation are the absolute contraindications whereas relative contraindications will be the young patients smokers and also ophthalmopathy this is the relative contraindication young patients or smokers and ophthalmopathy is the relative contraindication of radioactive iodine ablation then the next important disease is we have hashimotos thyroiditis so what do you see in hashimotos thyroiditis so in this hashimotos thyroiditis it is also called as stroma lymph lymphomatosa where the lymph thyroid tissue will be converted into the lymphoid tissue so it is actually an autoimmune disorder where there is anti thyroid peroxidase antibodies are present and it is also associated with hla b8 and also it is associated with dr3 and dr5 so if you see the etiology etiology there will be cd4 mediated there will be cd4 mediated cytotoxicity cd8 cd4 mediated cd8 cytotoxicity will be there which will lead to permanent destruction of the thyroid follicles and thus it will lead to permanent hypothyroidism it will lead to permanent hypothyroidism so this will result in lifelong you should give lifelong levothyroxine should be given to the patient and also this uh, mm, hashimotos thyroiditis increases the risk of papillary carcinoma of thyroid and it also increases the risk of thyroid lymphoma so what are the clinical features which you see here you will see features of hypothyroidism will be seen and there will be mild enlargement of the gland so that there is increased circumference of the neck will be increased because of the enlargement of the gland next so how are you going to diagnose the patient diagnosis is you have to detect the anti thyroid peroxidase antibodies can be detected and investigation of choice 
is you can do FNAC. So the diagnosis is mainly done by antithyroid peroxidase antibody, and you can also do FNAC where you will pre see presence of increased lymphocytic infiltration, and you will also see presence of herthal cells or Eskenazi cells are seen. So how are you going to treat it? Treatment is by you should give the patient lifelong. Thyroxine should be given to the patient and if there is any suspicion of malignancy then you should do total thyroidectomy is given is done. And in, that's how, in, in, okay, if there is suspicion, is suspicious of malignancy then you can do total thyroidectomy can be done in the patient. Okay. So this is about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Then, then the next important thing is acute suppurative thyroiditis is present. This acute suppurative thyroiditis is a suppurative infection of thyroid which is most commonly due to the staphylococcal aureus more than streptococcus. It is most commonly seen in children mainly because of persistent pyriform sinus. It is seen in children due to persistent pyriform sinus which is a connection with what is persistent py pyriform sinus. This will form a connection between the oropharynx and the thyroid. Okay, this is this acute suppurative thyroiditis is actually preceded by uh, presence of preceded by otitis media and it is also preceded by upper respiratory tract infection. The thyroid is resistant. Thyroid is actually resistant to infection. Why? Because of rich vascular supply and also due to rich lymphatic supply, the thyroid is resistant to infection. And there will be high iodine content will be seen in the thyroid gland. And thyroid is also resistant to infection due to fibrous capsule. Thyroid is resistant to infection due to rich vascular and lymphatic supply, high iodine content and fibrous capsule. Now, if you see the root of infection, in the root of infection, first it can be due to the, from, this is the thyroid, it can come from the blood that is hematogenous spread can be there or it can be directly, it can come from the pyriform sinus which is connecting the oropharynx with the thyroid and it can also result in infection. There can be some penetrating trauma which can result in infection or in immunocompromised patients you will see infection. Then if you see the clinical features, clinical features include pain and tenderness is seen uh, over the thyroid with chills and rigors and fever and uh, chills and rigors and fever is seen. Investigations are you will see increased ESR and increased WBC count will be seen. On FNAC you will see presence of neutrophils are seen. Then if you do culture and sensitivity, here you will see presence of organism and antibiotic sensitivity will be seen on culture and sensitivity. Treatment is incision and drainage plus antibiotics can be given to the patient and the rule is first and foremost rule out pyriform sinus. In recurrent cases, if there is any recurrent cases, you should rule out pyriform sinus by barium fallow. You can, do, you can do barium swallow and you can rule out the pyriform sinus in recurrent cases. This is acute suppurative thyroiditis. Then we have subacute thyroiditis. Subacute thyroiditis is also called as dequervian thyroiditis or we can also call it as viral thyroiditis or granulomatous thyroiditis or giant cell thyroiditis. So if you see the first this is characterized by there is first and foremost upper respiratory tract infection which is mainly caused by viruses. This will lead to a granulomatous infection which will again lead to the follicular destruction. This granulomatous infection will lead to follicular destruction and it will result in giant cell formation will occur. Okay. Now it is actually associated with HLA B35. It is associated with HLA B35. Initially, because of the inflammation and granulation tissue, there will be destruction of the thyroid follicle. And this destruction of thyroid follicle will release the T3 and T4, thus causing hyperthyroidism. Later, the released T3 and T4, this is used up. And once it is used up, this becomes euthyroid. And finally, because of the destruction of thy thyroid, no T3 and T4 are produced. So, as a result, there will be hypothyroidism. Then finally, these 
uh, there will be spontaneous resolution in these cases the patients will have spontaneous resolution in 90 percent of cases so as a result the patient becomes youth thyroid so these are the important stages so initially there will be hyperthyroidism followed by youth thyroidism then hypothyroidism then finally the patient comes back to youth thyroid again then clinical features are here the patient will have pain and tenderness will be seen in the patient and this is associated with the signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism the investigations which are done are increased esr and decreased increased esr and decreased radioactive iodine ablation scan is done because the thyroid follicles are destroyed there will be decreased radioactive iodine scan investigation of choice for diagnosis is fnac is done and presence of giant cells are seen on fnac then how are you going to treat this patient treatment is you can do give nsaids to control the infection and you can also give in steroids in especially non responding cases you can give steroids in 90% of patients mostly you will see that spontaneous resolution will occur in 90% of cases then we have something called has riedel's thyroiditis in riedel's in riedel's thyroiditis you will this is also called has invasive fibrous thyroiditis riedel's thyroiditis is also called has invasive fibrous thyroiditis where there is complete replacement of the thyroid gland into the fibrous tissue so as a result there is the symptoms of hypothyroid because of the destruction of thyroid gland there will be decreased t3 and t4 there will be symptoms of hypothyroidism will be seen and here on examination the thyroid becomes woody on examination the thyroid would becomes woody and hard and because this will compress the trachea if it compresses the trachea it causes dyspnea and if it compresses the esophagus also which is present on back then it will cause dysphagia then if it, if it compresses the recurrent laryngeal nerve then it will result in uh, hoarseness of voice so if you see the fnac is not sufficient for diagnosis you should do investigation of choice is you should do wedge shaped excision biopsy is done in the patient so management management the treatment of choice in this patient is you should do wedge shaped excision biopsy should be done in the patient and also lifelong thyroid lifelong levothyroxine can be given to the patient okay this lifelong levothyroxine is mainly given for permanent hypothyroidism then we can also give the patient lifelong calcium and vitamin d supplementation is given to the patient this is for permanent hypoparathyroidism we give this drug next the next important is tumors the first important tumor of thyroid is papillary carcinoma of thyroid this papillary carcinoma of thyroid is actually the most common it is the most common thyroid malignancy it is most commonly seen in iodine sufficient areas then then if you see the papillary carcinoma of thyroid low dose radiation exposure will during childhood low dose radiation exposure during childhood will increase the risk of the patient and even the thyroglossal cyst will increase the risk of the patient and also the hashimoto thyroiditis will also increase the risk of the patient with the papillary carcinoma of thyroid so if you see the pathology here you will see presence of papillary ink projections will be seen and also there will be optically clear nucleus will be there in the cell and this is called has orphan i any nucleus is seen this is orphan any nucleus is seen then if you see the other other things there will be presence of dystrophic calcifications will be present which is actually somoma bodies are the dystrophic calcifications which are seen then other conditions of somoma bodies where somoma bodies are seen are somoma bodies are seen in papillary carcinoma of thyroid it is also seen in papillary the variant of renal cell carcinoma it is also seen in serous cystadenoma of ovary and it is also seen in meningioma in all these cases somoma bodies are seen so somoma bodies are also seen in papillary carcinoma of thyroid here you will see presence of midline swelling in the anterior part of the uh, thyroid and there will be a palpable lateral cervical lymph node 
which is called as lateral aberrant thyroid what is lateral aberrant thyroid here there will be a lateral cervical here in the neck itself there will be a lateral cervical lymph node which will be palpable this palpable lateral cervical lymph node is palpable with metastatic deposit of papillary carcinoma of thyroid now if you see the root of spread the root of spread of this um, thyroid malignancy is lymphatic spread you will see and then if you see the metastatics it goes to the lungs for metastasis then what is the investigation of choice for diagnosis is fnac then treatment is you should do total thyroidectomy should be done with removal of central group of lymph nodes because it is going to the lymph nodes you should remove central group of lymph nodes and you should also do ipsilateral modified radical neck dissection is done then lymph nodes uh, okay this is about the papillary carcinoma of thyroid next important thing is we have is follicular carcinoma of thyroid in follicular carcinoma of thyroid this is seen in iodine deficient areas whereas the papillary carcinoma is seen in iodine sufficient areas whereas follicular carcinoma is iodine deficient areas most common malignancy is it is seen is long standing goiter is seen and it is common in 5th to 6th decade of life okay in follicular carcinoma you will see mutations of pax8 p10 mutation and p53 mutation and ras mutations are seen in papillary sorry follicular carcinoma of thyroid in follicular carcinoma of thyroid pax8 mutations p10 p53 and ras mutations are seen so if you see the clinical features there will be sudden increase in the size of the gland increase in the size of the gland will be there there is no pain or minimal pain will be there there will be no evidence of trachea or esophageal compression is not there there is no evidence of trachea or esophageal compression is not there and one thing there is no lymphatic spread if you see papillary carcinoma lymphatic spread is seen here there is no lymphatic spread and here you will see presence of hematogenous spread is seen and most common site of metastasis is bones for follicular carcinoma for papillary carcinoma it is lungs in the bones it is most common in vertebrae followed by ribs followed by pelvis followed by skull okay then this follicular carcinoma there is something called has pulsatile secondaries are seen which are actually osteolytic secondaries and they are hypervascular these osteolytic hypervascular secondaries are seen in renal cell carcinoma and follicular carcinoma of thyroid then if you see the investigation fnac it cannot differentiate the uh, follicular adenoma with ca follicular carcinoma so to in order to differentiate you will do biopsy in the biopsy you will see that on seeing the vascular and capsular invasion you can be sure that it is follicular carcinoma rather than follicular adenoma then how are you going to treat it the treatment of choice for this patient is total thyroidectomy is actually the treatment of choice the lymph node dissection is not needed in this patient because there is no lymphatic spread there is only hematogenous spread is seen in these patients let us learn about well differentiated thyroid cancers so if you see the well differentiated thyroid cancers there are two one papillary carcinoma of thyroid and second follicular carcinoma of thyroid next if you see the pre operative management for well differentiated carcinoma of thyroid what pre operative management do you do first you will do thyroid suppression should be done for thyroid suppression you give high dose of thyroxine is given high dose of thyroxine is given for 6 to for 6 weeks and this will decrease the tsh high dose of thyroxine is given for 6 weeks to decrease the tsh once there is decreased the tsh this will prevent the thyroid a remnant to proliferate the proliferation of thyroid remnant is not there okay then then whole body scan should be done in the whole body scan we do iodine 120 131 iodine 131 whose half life is 8 days is used for whole body scan then you should stop after whole body for whole body scan you should stop thyroxine at least within 6 weeks and you should if the patient cannot tolerate you should shift shift T three, T four to T three, and then you should stop this T three for two weeks. 
so in whole body scan iodine 131 is given you should stop thyroid for 6 weeks and then you should shift the patient from t4 to t3 and then you should stop the thyroid for 2 weeks for 2 weeks you should stop the thyroid then then if you see you can also give recombinant tsh can be given for 48 hours before the whole body scan and advantage of iodine 131 is it can be used to diagnose and it can also be used to ablate the remaining thyroid remnant can be ablated okay next it also makes the thi this iodine 131 will make the thyroid globulin has a better marker for follow up okay next what are the investigations which you do for follow up for investigations you can do the thyroid globulin is done which is less than 2 nanogram per ml is done for follow up it should be less than 2 nanogram per ml after thyroidectomy and then you can do ultrasonography neck can be done and chest x ray can be done has investigations then if you see the indication in indication you can do pet scan on pet scan you will see presence of increased thyroglobulin is seen on the pet scan and with normal usg neck and chest x ray on pet scan is done if there is it is done if there is increased thyroglobulin which normal usg neck and chest x ray you can do pet scan then management is you can do radioactive iodine ablation is done then management for recurrence this is not normally for recurrence the management is radioactive iodine ablation is done then what about the prognostic indicators these are important these prognostic indicators are actually we have one we have ages one is ages what is ages ages is a for age g for grade then e for extra thyroid invasion and uh, s for size so ages is age grade extra thyroid invasion ages is age grade extra thyroid invasion age grade and extra thyroid invasion is ages then we have ames in ames we have a m e s so in this we have age metastasis extra thyroid metastasis we have extra thyroid invasion also and you see size is also seen so we have ames ames you have age metastasis extra thyroid invasion and size is seen in ames then we have masses what do you see in masses masses is metastasis you will see a for age and c for completeness of original resection will be there i for invasion and s for size is seen masses is metastasis age completion of original resection invasion and size is seen that is masses then what is the bad prognostic factors bad prognostic factors is size more than 4 cm and extra capsular spread size more than 4 cm and extra capsular spread is the bad prognosis then then if you see the good prognosis then if you see the good prognosis is size more than sorry size one less than 1 cm and age less than 40 years is good prognosis then we have metastatic carcinoma sorry then we have medullary carcinoma of thyroid in medullary carcinoma of thyroid this arises mainly from the para follicular c cells of thyroid and it is derived from the ultimo bronchial these para follicular c cells are derived from the ultimo bronchial bodies and these will secrete the calcitonin then if you see the in medullary carcinoma of thyroid calcitonin level is raised despite of raised calcitonin level calcium is normal in these patients so types are they are of two types we have sporadic type of medullary carcinoma of thyroid then we also have familial type of medullary carcinoma of thyroid sporadic type is seen in 80% familial in 20% familial is associated with men and non men syndrome also whereas sporadic is seen in sixth decade whereas familial is seen in mainly young patients sporadic is seen single lesion will be seen in familial you will see multiple lesions will be seen in sporadic you will see unilateral lesion whereas in familial you will see bilateral lesion so both these are the differences so sixth decade sporadic you will see in 80% of cases seen in sixth decade and single and unilateral whereas familial 20% of patients with men syndrome young patients and multiple patients so if you see the clinical features it is mainly seen there is a midline swelling in the anterior part of the neck with raised calcitonin will be seen 
and with history of diarrhea will be seen and there is amyloid stoma will also be seen in the patient and there can be positive family history of pheochromocytoma and hyperparathyroidism because this is associated with men 2a or men 2b syndrome then if you see the root of spread root of spread is both hematogenous and the lymphatic spread can be seen if you see most common site of metastasis is in the liver both hematogenous and lymphatic spread ts it is actually tss in tsh independent tumor so it does not undergo radioactive iodine therapy then in this the chemotherapy has limited role in thyroid malignancies and also in salivary gland tumors the chemotherapy has limited role then we have root of spread no investigation investigation of choice is we should do fnac should be done and treatment is you should do total thyroidectomy should be done to the patient and also because it can go through the lymph node spread you should do routine lymph node dissection is done and also you can do ipsilateral modified radical neck dissection is done this is especially done if tumor is more than 1 cm and if nodes are positive then you can do bilateral modified radical neck dissection is done if lymph nodes are positive then this has actually poor prognosis why it has poor prognosis because it does not respond to radioactive iodine ablation then we have next important is ana anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid in anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid it is actually a rare tumor occurring in 7th and 8th decade of life it is seen um, the, there are two malignancies which occur in 7th and 8th decade of life that is anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid and also prostatic carcinoma will occur in 7th to 8th decade then if you see the clinical features there is sudden increase in size of the swelling will be seen along with the severe pain is seen on swallowing and the patient will have spread is mainly by direct invasion is the main spread of anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid then there will be evidence of compression to trachea if this compresses the trachea it will lead to dysphagia dyspnea first dyspnea if it compresses the esophagus it will lead to dysphagia then it will compress the recurrent laryngeal nerve then this will result in uh, hoarseness of voice also okay then then in invest most common site of metastasis is lungs is the most common site of metastasis then for medullary carcinoma most common site of metastasis is liver whereas for anaplastic carcinoma it is lung investigation of choice is fnac can be done and it is resectable tumor you can do total thyroidectomy can be done in resectable tumor if it is unresectable tumor then you should do tracheostomy is done in the patient this has actually poor prognosis is seen in the patient next then we have thyroid lymphoma what do you see in thyroid lymphoma in this this is actually the most common type of non hodgkins lymphoma is thyroid lymphoma the risk factors are you will see presence of hashimoto's thyroiditis can result in thyroid lymphoma and even chronic lymphocytic lymphocytes the chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis can also result in thyroid lymphoma then if you see the clinical features here you will see presence of rapid growing tumor will be seen and this is seen with painless and fever will be seen and it is associated with cervical lymphadenopathy the cervical lymphadenopathy will cause obstruction to the trachea causing dyspnea and they also cause obstruction to the esophagus causing dysphagia they can obstruct the recurrent laryngeal nerve thus causing um, uh, hoarseness of voice then some can develop hypothyroidism also investigation of choice for thyroid lymphoma is biopsy is done then treatment is you can do external beam radiotherapy is done along with chemotherapy to these patients then what is the chemotherapy regimen you give chop regimen to these patients which is you give cyclophosphamide is given h5 you can give hydroxy donorubicin is given along with oncovin and also prednisolone is given for the patient next if there are any compressive symptoms then you should give thyroidectomy should be done along with lymph node dissection is done if there is any compressive symptoms then let us now learn some important points about thyroidectomy so thyroidectomy here the position is rose position we call it also called as barking dog position we say 
and here in this position the first and foremost you will extend the head head is extended and 30 degrees up it will be extended and it will be almost 30 degrees up will be seen you will put a towel is put below the shoulder grades and you will the main importance of this position is here you will get a bloodless field in the neck so because of the bloodless field you can easily operate so what are the disadvantages there is increased risk of air embolism is seen in these conditions then you will give an incision called as coachers transfers cervical collar incision is given this coacher cervical collar incision is actually given if this is the thyroid cartilage it is given actually one centimeter and this is the required cartilage it is given one centimeter below the required cartilage you give the coachers incision in the neck one centimeter below the required cartilage you give the coachers incision then subcutaneous tissue and platysma are also dissected and subplatysmal flaps are raised then they are raised superiorly they are raised till thyroid cartilage they are raised and inferiorly they are raised till suprasternal notch so here you will actually expose the patient till the thyroid cartilage here you will expose the patient and here you will expose the neck of the patient till the uh, suprasternal notch then you will have to incise the muscles in the midline all the muscles in the midline are incised and they are retracted and then after this you will see the thyroid gland so now thyroid gland is exposed in the thyroid gland we have vein called as middle thyroid vein will be seen this middle thyroid vein it is first ligated this is the first structure to be ligated is middle thyroid vein it is ligated which is middle thyroid vein is ligated to prevent avulsion uh, if there is avulsion of middle thyroid vein this will lead to air embolism so to prevent air embolism we will ligate the middle thyroid vein then we have superior thyroid vessels will be there superior thyroid vessels and we have inferior thyroid vessels also you will have superior thyroid artery this is inferior thyroid artery superior thyroid vein inferior thyroid vein now you will ligate the superior thyroid artery and veins are ligated close to the gland okay they are diverted close to the gland it is to prevent the injury to external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve they want to prevent the injury so it is ligated close to the gland whereas inferior thyroid vessels they are also ligated close to the gland this is ligated close to the gland to prevent uh, parathyroid infarction to prevent parathyroid gland infarction they are also ligated close to the gland then then if you see the then then if you see the next important thing is right if you were asked what is the most common nerve prone to injury is recurrent laryngeal nerve is most vulnerable to injury among all these recurrent laryngeal nerve is most vulnerable to injury in the vicinity of the ligament of berry near the ligament of berry it is most vulnerable to injury if there is bleeding in this region it is controlled by gentle pressure you should not use you should avoid using electrocautery in these patients in this area because this can result in uh, injury to the nerve after division of ligament now this thyroid is actually separated from trachea by the sharp dissection okay and then the thyroid gland is removed very good next next what about the parathyroid glands the parathyroid glands they are identified by the presence of golden brown color and they are also canary shape, yellow color they are identified with golden yellow color and canary yellow color now if you do if you remove it accidentally accidental removal of the parathyroid gland then you should take the accidental removed parathyroid gland and uh, divide it into one millimeter pieces and you will transplant it into the belly of sternocleidomastoid here you will transplant it in sternocleidomastoid muscle okay then that is accidental removal of parathyroid gland then then if if there is hyperparathyroidism and for this if you remove the parathyroid gland due to hyperparathyroidism that is hyper, parathyroid hyperplasia if there is parathyroid hyperplasia 
and you have removed parathyroid glands then you will remove three and half glands are removed in this case okay and remove and the remaining half gland this is transplanted in the brachioradialis it is transplanted in the brachioradialis of the non dominant hand okay next next if you see he complications complications include the patient will have hemorrhage this is mainly caused by the bleeding of muscular arteries will result in hemorrhage or it can be due to the slippage of ligature from superior thyroid vessels will result in hemorrhage then if you see the next massive bleeding if there is massive bleeding in the neck this massive bleeding will also result in the tension hematoma this will result in tension hematoma then how are you going to manage this tension hematoma for this tension hematoma you will have to first shift the patient to the ot and then you will open the sutures and control the bleeding and then control the bleeding by ligating the bleeding vessels you will open the sutures and controlling control the bleeding by ligating the bleeding vessels if there is any hematoma formation is seen then you should drain the hematoma in the patients then if the patient presents with respiratory obstruction this respiratory obstruction the most common cause of respiratory obstruction after thyroidectomy is is due to laryngeal edema okay patient can present with respiratory obstruction also then due to thyroidectomy there can be third nerve injuries can be there if you were asked most common nerve injury is actually external branch of superior laryngeal nerve is involved other nerves like recurrent laryngeal nerve and cervical sympathetic trunk can also be involved this external branch of superior laryngeal nerve is involved mainly near the superior thyroid vessels it is involved then then the fourth the complication is you will see that there will be parathyroid insufficiency will be there especially this is most common after second to fifth day of surgery you can see this parathyroid insufficiency most common cause is due to the vascular infarction of parathyroid which parathyroid glands which you see in the in near the inferior thyroid vessels now in this patient whenever there is decreased parathormone there is decreased calcium so the patient manifests with tetany and also carpo pedal spasms will be seen in the patient okay and there will be tingling and sensation in the oral or perioral region the patient will have tingling sensation over the perioral region and how are you going to treat it the treatment of this is if mild or moderate mild to moderate symptoms are present then you should give oral calcium supplementation is given for mild to moderate the treatment and if it is severe symptoms are present then you should give iv calcium gluconate is given to the patient then if you see the next complication is there will be thyroid insufficiency will be seen and also the patient will also have thyrotoxic crisis will be seen in the patient this thyrotoxic crisis the most common cause is it is due to the inadequate pre operative preparation will result in thyrotoxic crisis in the patient then then we have something called as me what what is this me what it is it is actually minimally invasive video assisted thyroid surgery so here you will the length of the cervical incision which you give is only 1.5 to 2 cm through this you will put an endoscopic camera is put and the there are instruments are put for retraction on dissection and this is mainly performed in benign lesions not in the benign lesions we perform it for lobectomy and you can also perform if an, with an experienced surgeon we can also perform it for malignant lesions like papillary carcinoma of thyroid you can do total thyroidectomy can be done in this case then what are the indications of uh, me what that is minimally assisted video minimally invasive video assisted thyroid surgery is here it is mainly indicated for benign thyroid nodule of less than 3 cm and it is also in indicated in papillary carcinoma of less than 2 cm and the contraindications are thyroiditis is the contraindication for this minimally invasive thyroid surgery then thank you and thank you for watching